We've been in the book of Revelation, and so we'll uh, look there uh, to start this morning in Revelation chapter 8 to be, uh, uh, to be specific. And uh, as we um, move into Revelation chapter 8, just let me remind you that uh, the tribulation is, uh, was predicted in the book of Daniel, and it's sometimes referred to as the 70th week of Daniel. And it's the last time uh, of preparation for the nation of Israel. And, uh, and God is also going to judge the Gentiles and the world uh, for their rejection of Jesus Christ. Uh, this 70th week uh, actually does not start with the rapture of the church. We've looked at this before. But um, there'll be a, uh, the rapture of the church will happen before that. And then after the rapture of the church, there'll be a short time period where the Antichrist will come in and become the world leader. Uh, as a world leader, and basically at this point, he is the leader of the West. Uh, he will lead 10 nation states that will come out of the West or the European or the old revived Roman Empire. Uh, people uh, sometimes ask, uh, well, where is the United States in this? The United States is not mentioned in biblical prophecy. I don't know what's going to happen to us. Uh, we could implode. And uh, no matter who the president is, uh, that could happen. Uh, there are things going on in this country that are not good, from finances and debt to morals uh, to all kinds of things that could call, cause this country to implode. Uh, if the United States is in prophecy, at best, it would be part of the Ten King Coalition that comes out of the West. But uh, the United States would not be a leader. It would just simply be part of that coalition, if at all. And uh, it very well could be that uh, the agreement between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico, maybe all three will make up just the one part. We don't know. Uh, Canada and Mexico aren't mentioned in prophecy either. All right? And so, uh, uh, there, I left that. Now, uh, what does start the uh, seven-year tribulation time period? What starts is that this leader of the West is going to guarantee or sign an agreement with the nation of Israel. Israel, by implication, has to exist as a sovereign state. It does today. And there's a deal that's going to be made. And the deal is, is that Israel will be protected for seven years. And their peace is going to be guaranteed by this world leader. Um, as we think of that peace, uh, uh, while it doesn't say it directly, it is strongly implied that Israel will be allowed to sacrifice like it did in the Old Testament. And Israel will have a temple. Exactly when the temple is going to be built, we don't know, but we do know this. That by the midpoint of the tribulation time period, the temple will be complete. And we know that because the Bible predicts after three and a half years or the midpoint of the tribulation that the Antichrist uh, is going to um, set up an image and he is going to set himself up in the temple as if he were God. And uh, this is called the great abomination. It's called the great abomination uh, in the book of Daniel. Jesus in Matthew 24 in the Olivet Discourse makes direct reference to this great abomination. This is a, uh, a real central point in the tribulation time period, is this great abomination. Uh, as we stop and we think of uh, this, uh, 
three and a half years later, and uh, we're told that the, uh, uh, there's a couple of verses that Daniel makes reference to, and then Paul makes reference uh, to this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, it says, And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Uh, I might just say, uh, in, in reference to the term antichrist, we all use that term. It's actually not used that often in the Bible. It comes out of 1 John, and John refers to him as the antichrist. And in the Latin, the word anti uh, means against. But in the Greek, the word anti means a substitute for. And, uh, and since the Bible was written and John wrote in Greek, uh, what we find in Satan is this, is that he is presenting himself as a substitute Christ. And, uh, and as we think of everything that is promised, in fact, I was uh, thinking of the spirit of Antichrist, and I've... Uh, you know, I have been to New York City a couple times, but I've never been to the UN, or uh, I've only seen the UN in pictures. But from what I understand is that in the UN, uh, they have a motto that comes out of the Bible. And it's the verse that makes reference to the swords being beat into plowshares and the end of war. And as we stop and we think of when that is referenced to in the Bible, it's referenced to the kingdom of God. When he sets up his throne, there won't be a need for weapons of war because there will be an enforced peace. And the world today wants peace. The world today wants prosperity. The world today wants health care. The world today uh, wants to, uh, like they say, live peaceable. And uh, guess what? The Antichrist is going to offer. He is going to offer peace. In fact, the spirit of Antichrist, the substitution, I would say this, the UN is an Antichrist. It's a substitute. They are going to, is their motto, usher in peace to the world. The Bible tells us that only Jesus Christ can do that. And folks, it's important for us to understand that no matter how noble the organization may make itself sound, only Jesus Christ can bring peace. Only Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. Any other politician who makes promises is really substituting themselves for Jesus Christ and in the Greek sense of the word, the substitution, they are Antichrist. Uh, are you with me on that? And we need to um, uh, just uh, pay attention to that. We've uh, taken a look and uh, we looked at uh, two twos in the book of Revelation, uh, two witnesses, and, uh, uh, and then this great abomination that will take place. And following that great abomination, the... Uh, Antichrist is going to set himself up for 42 months, which by the way is 1260 days. The Bible is very, very uh, uh, distinct about that. And at the end of this seven year period, Jesus Christ is going to return. And he is going to defeat the Antichrist totally. And he is going to establish his kingdom where the nation of Israel will be the leading country in the world. And, uh, uh, and where, I don't want to jump ahead too much, but that's going to be a fascinating time, and we'll talk about that uh, when that time comes. Now, in the book of Revelation, and this is where we uh, uh, left off last, uh, last week, we have... Uh, the trumpet judgments. And let me just go back and let me just say that it's not seven judgments, seven judgments, and seven judgments. These are all connected. 
And the seventh seal contains the seven trumpets. And the seventh trumpet announces the uh, uh, seven bold judgments. So there's not 21 judgments, there's 19. And uh, uh, they're all contained in those uh, seals. And so as we stop and we think of these, um, uh, let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 8. I hope you already did. I'll open my Bible to Revelation chapter 8. And uh, uh, we'll begin right here. Uh, verse 1. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hands. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it unto the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquake. And I might just say that uh, this uh, uh, is an answer to the saint's prayer that was mentioned earlier in the book of Revelation. And we'll come back and just make a couple of observations on the incense in the moment. But what we have is the seven angels with seven trumpets. Verse 6, And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. And I don't know what that means. If they're, uh, uh, I played a trumpet, and what did we do? We licked our lips and licked the... Uh, it's hard to play with a dry mouthpiece, isn't it? So, yeah. right, so I don't know what the preparation is, uh, what they did right here, but uh, they were prepared to blow their trumpets. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire uh, mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burned up, and all the grass was burned up. But let me just make a few comments about the trumpet judgments. We do see some um, uh, uh, different characteristics uh, about the uh, judgments that came. The first six seals uh, are events that have actually happened in nature. They're very intense and they're big, but when you stop and think about it, uh, we have had wars, haven't we? Uh, we have had famine before. We have had disease before. Right now, we're all worried about the coronavirus. Uh, there have been diseases. And, but now, when we move into uh, the trumpet judgments, they start to take a supernatural, uh, uh, how can I put it, a, a, a supernatural characteristic. Uh, these are things that we don't see uh, in nature uh, that just naturally happen. There are some things that are going to take place that have never uh, taken place before, not even on a small scale. And one of the problems that men have, and Peter addresses this, is we say, well, when it comes to judgments, if it's never happened before, it's never going to happen. And uh, all of us have done things like that, haven't we? Or said things like that? Well, how can that be? That's never happened before. I've never seen that before. And uh, what's the implication of a statement that, well, that's never happened before, is that it can't happen in the future. Well, I want you to know that what the Bible says is going to happen in the future doesn't matter if it ever happened before. There's a lot of things that are in the Bible that never happened before. And God said, and he did it, the creation of man never happened before the creation. There was a starting point. And, uh, uh, and so the events that take place, don't be fooled and don't be lulled into sleep uh, like 
men will be. All things are always going to be the same. And we've got our ups and downs. And, and now we're kind of in a down period. But the rain will come back. Uh, and, uh, and yet, uh, there's going to be some events to take place that are a uh, uh, pretty, pretty big deal. The other thing about these trumpet judgments is this is that they're, they are broken in the scripture here into two parts. The first four, and that's what we'll look at right here, are connected to the plagues in Egypt. There's a parallel between the two. The last three are called the woe judgments. And we probably won't have time to get into the woe judgments, but we'll, uh, we'll certainly mention them. And, uh, and as we stop and we think of these right here, let's just get back to Revelation chapter 8 and we'll go through uh, this right here. Uh, verse 7, the first angel sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth and the third part of trees was burnt up and all the green grass was burnt up. And as we stop and we think of Exodus, and we won't, I won't take the time to uh, go back to Exodus and look these up, but if you remember the 10 plagues, uh, four of these plagues uh, are parallel right here in Revelation. Uh, and we have in this first, uh, or this first one right here, we have uh, what we would say is uh, uh, an attack on vegetation. And uh, it happened uh, right there. Well, let's read on. In verse uh, 8, And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. Now, it doesn't say that a great mountain was cast into the sea. It says that uh, something like a great mountain, as if it were a great mountain, burning with fire, was cast into the sea. Exactly what that is going to be, I'm not sure. But as we stop and we think, and I, I uh, have mentioned that uh, we should take the Bible as literally as we can. And uh, figurative, there's lots of figures of speech in the Bible. <coughs> and as we think of these figures of speech, uh, when the text demands it, and it's obvious that it's a figure of speech, go with it. But if not, then go with what the text has to say. And here we have something like a mountain. Uh, and that would suggest it's big, it's burning with fire, and it's cast into the sea. Um, and the third part of the sea became blood. And, uh, and as we uh, think of that, uh, we can take the rest of this verse literally, literally a third part of the sea uh, became uh, blood. Uh, and a third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. Take that literally. There's one third of everything that lives that's marine. Uh, is gone. And as we stop and we think of uh, this right here in Exodus chapter 7, we have the Nile River uh, turning to blood. And as we think of the Nile River um, really provided the fresh water for the uh, uh, nation of Egypt, uh, no more. And uh, I think that the uh, stench of dying fish and whatever was in the Nile River must have been just awful at, uh, at, at that particular time. Uh, let's read on. And verse 10, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of water. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Now we don't uh, know what this great star from heaven uh, is exactly, but we do know this, that the result 
of this coming down and attacking the water. And again, uh, what do we see here? We see uh, a third part of all the rivers. This is fresh water. And uh, the wormwood made the water bitter. You couldn't drink it. Uh, you couldn't use it to water plants. Animals couldn't drink it. Uh, we have a poisoning of the water. This is, this is really, uh, you don't want to worry about water pollution. Uh, imagine this, one third of all the fresh water is now made bitter. Uh, we have in Exodus chapter seven, the drinking water in Egypt uh, was poisoned. And it was poisoned with this wormwood. And uh, uh, we have a parallel uh, right there. Well, let's read on. And the fourth angel in verse 12 sounded, and a third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And, uh, and I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, now that's the darkness, and if you remember, in Exodus uh, chapter 10, we have what? Darkness covered the land of Egypt. And when these four uh, are done, uh, these four, and you can see there's not a lot of ink uh, given to them, uh, but there's a couple of things that uh, happen. And uh, one observation is, boy, there's a lot of thirds in this, isn't there? A third of this, a third of that, a third of the waters, uh, a third, a third. And I'll just make a comment about that in just a, a minute. Verse 13, and I beheld and heard an angel uh, flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. And then in chapter 9, we have the three woe uh, uh, judgments. And so, um, as we stop and we think of uh, why and what's the significance of those first four? Uh, what's the significance of, of having a, a kind of a parallel between what happened in Egypt and what's happening in the tribulation. And the first item I've got right here is this. In both cases, God is getting Israel ready to be brought to their appointed uh, place. And as we stop and we think of, of the uh, ten plagues in Egypt, Israel was going to be taken out of Egypt and brought where? To their promised land. And as we stop and we talk of uh, uh, what's going, what is Israel being prepared to do during this tribulation time? They're being prepared for their appointed place as the leading nation of the world. And uh, this, is, uh, this is what we have. We have first the promised land and then the promised kingdom uh, that is being promised. And Israel Israel is the focal point of both of these. Uh, by the way, the Gentiles that are being uh, 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 judged in both the uh, Egypt and in the tribulation, they just got in the way. God is dealing with this nation of Israel. Uh, secondly, uh, in both cases, God revealed himself and extended grace. And in both cases, God's revelation was rejected. If you recall, it's very telling that Moses went to Pharaoh and announced what was going to happen before it happened and gave Pharaoh a chance to let the people go. And Pharaoh, in every case, rejected the re revelation that God had given him. And as we stop and we think, of uh, what's going on in uh, during the tribulation time period. Uh, just look back with me at chapter 6. And what we see is this. In verse 15, 
And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? Now in verse 16, uh, do people know what's going on? And it's very clear that they know exactly uh, that this is coming from, and they want to hide themselves from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. Listen, God made his, he revealed himself during the tribulation time period. And we took a look at the two witnesses that's got this thing going. And they are telling the world what's going on. And yet we find that what is what is going on. Now, to be to be fair, there's a great number in chapter 7 of Gentiles that do respond to the revelation of God. Uh, so many that they're uncountable. That's a lot. And uh, there's 144,000 Jewish men that are going to be sealed. And uh, so there are those who are responding to God's revelation. But I want you to know, the vast majority do not. And they uh, reject the very revelation of God. And as we uh, stop and we think of the, uh, the, this question that we just uh, asked in chapter 6, verse 17, and we tie that together with 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, there's a question in 17, who shall be able to stand? Uh, just turn back and we'll look at who is able to stand in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And in verse 7, we read this. And to you who are troubled, rest uh, uh, troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Well, that uh, puts us at the end of the tribulation. This is what he's making reference to. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we stop and we think of who will be able to stand, who will not be able to stand, those who don't know God, those who have not responded to the gospel of His grace, will not be able to stand. And, uh, uh, and Paul makes that very clear. And so, uh, how can you stand? And I'll tell you what. You better, uh, we've heard this thing, it's not what you know, it's who you know. I'll tell you what, uh, when it comes to our eternal salvation, nothing could be further from the truth. As we stop and we think, it's not how smart we are, it's who we know. And that is the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's some things we have to know about that. We have to know that this Savior paid the penalty for sin. This Savior uh, is resurrected in heaven. And it frees God to offer us the gift of eternal life. We know that. But we believe it. And we trust it. And Jesus Christ is the one uh, who makes all the difference in the world. It made the difference with Jehovah in the Old Testament, makes the difference in the Gospels as we think of, of the miracles that were performed. It makes the difference today in this church age, and it's going to make all the difference in the world in the uh, uh, future tribulation uh, that's, uh, that's, that's coming. Uh, we then have these wall judgments and uh, that's made reference to back in chapter 8 we read uh, verse uh, 13 and uh, the first uh, wall judgment in verse uh, uh, 10 is this uh, we have locusts and these locusts are satanically driven 
And uh, there's quite a description uh, given of these locusts, and we'll take a little bit more time to uh, talk, you know, specifically about that. But in the first 12 verses of chapter 9, uh, we have uh, these locusts, and they bit people. And what's interesting, they didn't eat vegetation. Now, locusts generally eat everything that's green. Uh, these locusts don't. They bite people, but they don't kill them. And, and it's going to be an awful time uh, during this particular uh, five-month period. Um, and, but that's what it says. We also have, uh, then in verses uh, 14 through 21, uh, fire and brimstone killing one, again, one-third of the population. We then have the seventh trumpet, which introduces us to the seven bowl judgments. Uh, Revelation chapters 15 and 16 describe those right there. Well, as we stop and we think of that, the uh, fraction one-third should have jumped out at us. Did it? I mean, one third, one third, one third. Uh, what is the significance of the one third? It's never explained directly, but I'd like to make a few suggestions uh, right here. And that, the first one is this. These events are not random. They are controlled events. And as we stop and we think, I don't care if it's a tornado in um, uh, Nashville and uh, people get killed, we say, wow, boy, a tornado's never hit here before. This is a freaky event. I think we're safe. Um, you know, tornadoes go through Minnesota here. I think Hutchinson is in the path and we're kind of close to that path. Um, you know, when you're on the Iron Range north of Duluth, uh, I guess they say tornadoes are going over in the sky above and across Lake Superior, but I'll tell you what, I think in my lifetime, one tornado touched down near Britt. I don't know if you know where Britt is, but uh, it, it, uh, it's up north of Virginia. Um, otherwise, it just doesn't happen. And what were people saying? Boy, this is odd. This is a funny thing. I don't think you have to worry about tornadoes if you live up here. Well, we had one. Yeah, we had one. It's kind of like earthquakes in Minnesota. I, I guess they had them years ago. But do any of you worry about earthquakes? No, what a freak thing that happens. And, uh, and yet, we see these thirds. These are not accidents, folks. One third, one third, one third. You know something? You've got to be in control of things to make sure that one third, one third, one third happens uh, all the time. Uh, second, uh, we have God's grace is still available. You know, God could have wiped out everybody, but he didn't. He, he metered this out. He metered it out. Very much like the plagues in Egypt. He metered them out, and they had a chance to respond time after time after time. And things just keep getting worse and worse and worse. And uh, by the time that the last one came, the killing of the oldest son, I'll tell you what, Egypt was ready to recognize who God was. But it was too late. It was too late. And there's a time coming in this country when God's grace is going to run out. Uh, another observation is this. Uh, man is not the master of the environment. Uh, we cannot determine uh, the future of this right here. This belongs to God. And I know we've heard all kinds of things about what's the, uh, uh, what, what, what's on the docket right now, the, uh, what's that Omar, what did she bring in? Green the Green New Deal. That's what I meant to say. The Green New Deal. It slipped my mind. Listen. We as human beings are not capable of changing our environment. We simply can't do that. God can. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't take care of 
uh, our environment. I mean, don't go outside and throw your trash all over the place. Pick it up. Um, uh, be clean. Uh, uh, does, does that make sense? Uh, use the, the restrooms. Don't go out in the street like they're doing out west or something like that. That's nonsense. But I'll tell you what, we are not going to change the rain. We're not going to change the storms. We're not going to divert tornadoes. It's just not going to happen. You know who can? The Creator. He's the only one who can. And, uh, and so uh, when we see these thirds, I want you to think about that. That there is a God in heaven who is in control of things. Well, in uh, closing this morning as we think of uh, the Lord's table, let, let me go back to the beginning of Revelation chapter 8. And as we think of the angel in verse 3 that stood at the altar having a golden censer, there was given unto him much incense. And I couldn't help but uh, keep in mind that uh, uh, this uh, uh, incense was brought in. And I've got a uh, picture here of the uh, tabernacle. I think that, that shows up. And on the outer court, we have the brazen altar. That's in the orange there. We have the labor. But inside the holy place, we have three pieces of furniture. The table of showbread, the altar of incense, and the lampstand. And then in the most holy place, we have the Ark of the Covenant. He's talking about the altar of incense. And as we stop and we think of this altar of incense, this uh, uh, was made with a spice that included, and we won't go back and look it up, four spices. And these four spices were laid out in a recipe from God. And it had to be just that way. And it couldn't be used for anything else. And these spices were taken in and put on the coals of the, uh, or burned, and it created smoke, and it represented the prayers that went up to heaven. And as we stop and we think of the priest that would bring the incense in, um, he couldn't just sit there and say, well, you know what, any old incense will do. He had to follow God's prescribed way. There's a prescribed way to approach God. And he couldn't just say, okay, it's time to burn it. You know, let's see, do I have any matches in my pocket or, uh, you know, lighter or something like that and light it? Couldn't be done that way. What they did is they went out to the altar and they took burning coals and they brought those coals into the holy place, and they, those coals went on the altar of incense. And it's interesting that as we think of the altar, the altar is, the cross is compared to the altar. Did you know that prayer is based on the altar? The reason we can pray is because Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. And as we stop and we think of this uh, uh, prescribed way in, in Revelation chapter 8, and uh, it says, And with the prayers of all the saints uh, upon the golden altar which was before the throne, and the smoke of the incense which came up with the prayers of the saints ascended, up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar. The cross is the, the altar is the basis for what we have in Jesus Christ. The altar becomes the basis for uh, approaching God in prayer. But you know something? That's never changed. That's never changed. And today we have uh, we're asked to re remember that Jesus Christ died. Did you know that the communion table is actually not a remembrance of his resurrection? It's not even a remembrance of the fact that we can pray. 
It's a remembrance of the basis for everything that we have in Christ. Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for sin. He took on a human body and became just like us so that he could be the perfect mediator, the one who could perfectly represent man to God. But as God, he was that perfect mediator, he could perfectly represent God to man. And that's exactly what happened at the cross. And because Jesus Christ became that perfect mediator and died on the cross for us, guess what? We can pray. We can have our sins forgiven. We can have a hope. We can have a future. And God never wants us to forget the basis of what we have in Christ. I'm going to tell you something. The reason we know that we have a home in heaven is because Jesus Christ died. The reason we can face tomorrow, remember that, that, that hymn, uh, we can face tomorrow because he lives. We can face tomorrow because he died for us first. I'll tell you what, the Lord's table is an important reminder for all of us. And God wants us as, as his children to just come together and just be quiet. And in the quietness of our hearts together, we remember what Jesus Christ did for us. I'd like to ask the ushers to, uh, uh, to come forward. And as they come forward, I'll read out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And, and I, I hope that with me you find it very fascinating that uh, um, even in the tribulation, the altar, the place of death is remembered as the basis um, for prayer.